justice and healing. The Holy Father meets several delegations of indigenous people from Canada. We hear from a faith leader who joined them. Fight for the unborn. Why the budget proposed by President Joe Biden is raising red flags for pro-lifers. Christian persecution. Analysis of a troubling rise in violence against the faithful in Nigeria. And back to Earth. How Russia and the United States helped to bring an astronaut home. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Pope Francis is in the midst of meeting this week with three delegations of Indigenous people from Canada. The discussions began on Monday and will continue tomorrow and Friday. The groups are at the Vatican following decades of alleged abuse at government-funded schools run by Christian organizations. They are joined by several Catholic bishops from Canada. So today, On Monday, indigenous people detailed the abuse and suffering they say came from Catholic priests and school workers. Joining us now from Rome is Bishop William McGrattan, Vice President of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and one of the clergy who has joined the Indigenous groups. Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Uh, um, first off, if you don't mind, can you remind us of some of the allegations against the government-funded Christian schools and specifically uh, the alleged decades of abuse by some Catholic priests and school workers? Well, basically, many of these stories came to light uh, in the late 80s and 90s. And at that point, um, the religious congregations that ran the schools offered apologies, uh, recognizing that sometimes sexual abuse and violence was perpetrated upon the students who were there in the residential schools in most uh, provinces in Canada. And since that time, uh, the Canadian government also has been involved, recognizing that they were the architects. Uh, they established the system of the residential schools. And so both the church and the state and the government have realized that there needs to be uh, paths of reconciliation uh, so that our people, uh, the communities, uh, begin to heal, especially families that have suffered from this particular type of uh, trauma in their lives through their parents or grandparents. Now, can you talk to us now about the meetings uh, between the Holy Father and the Indigenous groups? How are they going so far? Well, these encounters that are now taking place here in Rome, uh, we've been planning for this for close to two years. And so we've worked with three distinct communities, uh, the First Nations, uh, the Métis, and the Inuit. And the Vatican, through the Secretary of State and Pope Francis, wanted to afford each of these communities private encounters. And so there are three that have been scheduled. Already two of them have been completed. And part of the delegations are survivors of residential schools, uh, elders and knowledge keepers, and youth as well. And Pope Francis has been very attentive in the first two encounters, uh, listening to those uh, who are sharing the pain and the suffering but also their hopes uh, for the future, that uh, these meetings uh, can begin a new path of relationship with the church, and also that we can be walking with these communities so that, you know, our understanding of the gospel can be truly demonstrated in making sure that we're working towards a healing, uh, a path for these communities for the future. And before I let you go, I understand um, there's been some talk that Pope Francis will travel to Canada soon. Can you tell us what a visit from the Holy Father, what that would mean for everyone involved? Well, I believe, Tracy, you know, as we know in Scripture, you know, the shadow of Peter uh, can often bring a, a sense of healing and peace. And why the Holy Father has been so interested in issues of refugees, uh, the most current uh, situation in Europe, in Ukraine, in Russia. And I think his desire to, you know, walk with us, the bishops of Canada, in the path that we want to forge in this new relationship with our Indigenous communities. And in many ways, we recognize, 
his pastoral leadership in this desire to, to come and to be present uh, in the country of Canada, and we look forward to it. Um, we hope that by listening this week, he can be better prepared for when he does come for that pastoral visit. And Your Excellency, we have probably about a minute left or so, but I'm curious, um, is there anything that you would like our viewers to know about, something that we didn't touch on when it comes to the situation? Well, I think this situation is international. Um, we realize, too, that Canada has established these particular educational systems as a country, and we also that in other jurisdictions. Um, the United States, uh, parts of South America as well, and other parts of the world, Australia. And so these, I think, are international um, issues, and it's just happening and unfolding in the country of Canada at this point. And I think that is why the Vatican is, is keen to be seen and actively working and helping and assisting us in, in this reconciliation, in this path of, of, um, of uh, suffering that has been so devastating to many in these communities. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much for speaking with us about all of this. We appreciate it. Bishop William McGrattan, Vice President of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. A court in Finland has dismissed all charges against a former interior minister and a Lutheran pastor in a trial over free speech. Pavi Rosanen and Joanna Poyola had been charged with hate speech for referencing the Bible while addressing issues of life, marriage and sexuality. The unanimous ruling concluded it was not the court's responsibility to interpret biblical concepts. Supreme Court nominee Judge Katanji Brown Jackson has picked up an important vote toward likely Senate confirmation. Maine Senator Susan Collins has announced her support today. She becomes the first Republican to publicly commit her position. Judge Brown Jackson is poised to become the first black woman to serve as an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Our President Joe Biden's 2023 budget is nearly $6 trillion, and once again, it scraps all pro-life protections. For the second year in a row, the Hyde Amendment, which prevents taxpayer dollars from being used for abortions, has been left out. Republicans tell EWTN News Nightly they're not surprised. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales takes a closer look. The Democrats hate protection for life. Uh, and they have opposed the re-implementation of the Hyde Amendment, which restricts using government dollars for abortion every time it comes up. And that's not all. There's millions more for pro-abortion programs. The president's budget includes $400 million for Title X family planning programs for low-income women, a 40% increase from last year, $653 million for international family planning. Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, stands to gain millions. Its CEO praised Biden's agenda, stating, quote, We are pleased that the budget demonstrates a commitment to expanding reproductive freedom. We need the health care leaders in Congress to support domestic and global sexual and reproductive health and rights priorities. Catholic pro-life congressman Dr. Andy Harris says this is another example of President Biden and his administration wanting abortion on demand. Tomorrow, HHS Secretary Javier Becerra does plan to testify before the Appropriations Committee. Representative Harris plans to ask why Hyde Amendment and other pro-life protections are not included in the budget. I don't think that, that the, removing those protections, I don't think it, it lasts through Congress. I think the same thing will happen as last year. Those protections will be reinserted into the appropriations bills. Well, the head of Russia's delegation is in talks with Ukraine, uh, says progress is being made on a crucial issue. Vladimir Medinsky says Ukraine has submitted a set of proposals, including dropping its bid to join NATO. It also seems ready to not host foreign military bases. The sides just concluded two days of talks in Istanbul. President Joe Biden spoke today with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. The White House says they discussed military, economic and humanitarian assistance. And while the U.S. spends billions to help Ukraine battle Russia, the White House says it also needs billions more to fight another enemy, COVID. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. 
Tracy, good evening to you. This afternoon here at the White House, President Joe Biden implored Congress to act now and provide more funding to fight COVID, saying the nation can't wait until it's in the midst of another surge. But opponents of more spending say enough is enough. President Joe Biden updates the nation on COVID-19. We're now in a new moment in this pandemic. It does not mean that COVID-19 is over. It means that COVID-19 no longer controls our lives. That's what it means. The president also requested more money to fight the pandemic. There's no wall you can build high enough to keep out a virus. Congress needs to act now, please. But critics of that request cite billions of dollars in unspent COVID money. The White House also rolled out today COVID.gov, one-stop shopping for Americans who want to know more about masks, treatments, vaccines, and testing. And President Biden rolled up his sleeve for a second booster shot, which just got federal approval for people age 50 and over. And from the COVID front to the battlefront in Ukraine, Russia says this video shows its attack against Ukrainians manning a rocket launcher and the Ukrainians firing back. U.S. intelligence officials have determined Russian advisors are feeding President Vladimir Putin misinformation about the performance of Russian troops. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees calls it a completely senseless war. It's, it's civilians that are, that are impacted. And the fact that from one day to the other, they had to leave their jobs. Children couldn't go to school. Their ordinary family lives were completely devastated and turned upside down. This is shocking. An estimated six and a half million people have been displaced from their homes in Ukraine, with four million refugees fleeing the country, creating the worst food crisis since World War II. The White House also said today the U.S. will give Ukraine $500 million in budgetary aid to help pay for things like salaries and government services and to bolster its economy. The U.S. has previously okayed sending billions of dollars in aid to Ukraine. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, Middle East leaders discuss ways to ensure peaceful holy days among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Plus, how Russia and the United States teamed up to bring an astronaut home. A majority of voters believe the U.S. is going in the wrong direction. A new poll from Politico shows 70% of registered voters believe the country has, quote, pretty seriously gotten off track. And joining me now to discuss is Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Tom, welcome back. Always so great to see you. Uh, a, a lot to get to, but first, I want to talk about those poll numbers uh, that I just mentioned. What are your thoughts on that, and what do you think that may signal for the midterm elections? Well, it's obviously not good for Democrats and, and the party in power controlling all three uh, uh, chamber, the two chambers of Congress in the White House. And, and this is... Uh, this is along the same lines we've seen with a lot of polls, whether you look at the right track, wrong track, where uh, more than two thirds think the country is headed in the wrong direction, whether you look at the president's job approval rating, whether you look at concerns about inflation uh, in the economy, if you look at the generic congressional ballot, I mean, everywhere Democrats turn, they are seeing signs of doom and gloom. And unless something changes between now and November, uh, they're in for a very rough night. Yeah, something else I want to talk about this. Uh... Fox News report uh, Republicans on the House Select Committee for the Coronavirus Crisis um, are highlighting this cozy relationship uh, between the CDC officials and the American Federation of Teachers, saying the CDC positioned the teachers union to give line by line edits on school related COVID guidance. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that and your thoughts there. Well, obviously, this is something that the White House denied at the time and said that they were not cooperating with the teachers unions in such a, a, a close fashion. And now it turns out that, in fact, they were giving them authority over and inserting uh, language into the guidance of the CDC regarding schools. And so this is just another example, I think, of where the White House really sort of fudged and, and was not, as they told us repeatedly over the course of the last couple of years, just following the science. Yeah, and something else I want to talk about staying with COVID. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci recently suggested that we could possibly uh, go back to lockdowns or other COVID restrictions due to this new BA2 subvariant. Um, your take on that, and how do you think if that were to happen, people would respond? I don't think people would respond well. I think one of the things that we've seen uh, now coming out uh, over in, in the media over the last couple of months is just how how detrimental lockdowns were, not only for the economy and for businesses, but also for 
for children. Uh, you know, we're seeing the learning loss, we're seeing the emotional scars, we're seeing uh, the depression rates and suicides and things of those natures. And I think it's pretty well established now that lockdowns were were very harmful, particularly to kids. And so I don't think this is something that, while Fauci may say that, just out of an abundance of caution, that's certainly not where the administration is, and it's definitely not where the American people are. Uh, and some other news. Uh, the Washington Post authenticated emails from Hunter Biden's laptop and confirmed today that the president's son had multi-million dollar deals with Chinese executives. And, of course, this comes on the heels of The New York Times admitting the laptop is real. A story, as you know, The New York Post first reported back in October of 2020. I'd like to get your reaction to all this. Well, I mean, it's a couple of years late, and after both of those news organizations uh, dismissed it as a fake scandal, and, and the New York Post was obviously, their reporting was censored at the time, just in advance of the election. So it's, it's a, you know, too little too late, in my opinion, in terms of, uh, you know, these journalistic organizations finally coming to, uh, to grips with the fact that the, the Hunter Biden laptop was real, and they actually are now taking the time to authenticate them. The question now really goes to the next level, which is, will they investigate the potential links to the president himself? We know we have a former associate of, of Hunter Biden's who said that he met with President Biden. Um, about these business deals, and we know that there are laptop, uh, there are emails indicating that that Hunter Biden was was holding some equity uh, for the big guy who has been identified by that former associate as as Joe Biden himself. So we'll see whether the press remains curious about this story now that they've they finally gotten interested uh, two years after it officially broke. Tom, we have a little less than a minute left. I'm curious uh, what what else you're following now. Well, obviously, we're focused on the election. There's some, we, we talked about the initial poll uh, results that came out. Um, the generic congressional ballot, there was a Harvard-Harris poll that came out yesterday. Uh, Republicans up six points. But the astonishing uh, piece of data in that poll is that among independents, uh, Republicans are up 19, 18 points in the generic congressional ballot. That's the question that is asked. If the election were held today, would you vote for a Republican or a Democrat? Uh, that is a national poll, which means that in swing states and swing districts around the country, uh, it's most likely even more lopsided in terms of uh, favor for Republicans. So that is a that is a bad omen for Democrats, and we're keeping a close eye on that number and whether Democrats can improve it here uh, in leading up to the midterms. Okay, we'll leave it right there. Thanks so much, Tom, for your time. Always appreciate it. Thank you. A priest from Connecticut will be the new rector of the Pontifical North American College in Rome. Monsignor Thomas Powers is quite familiar with his new surroundings. He studied at the NAC to prepare for ordination and then returned as a resident while working at the Vatican until 2015. Monsignor Powers has served in pastoral, educational and leadership roles in the Diocese of Bridgeport. In Amman, Israel's president has met with the King of Jordan. The last official state visit between the two nations was back in 1994. Today's talks were the latest in a series of regional leaders to assure peaceful celebrations of the upcoming Jewish, Muslim and Christian feasts. On Monday, Israel hosted the U.S., Egypt and three other signatories to the Abraham Accords. Well, after a record-breaking amount of time in space, an American astronaut is back on Earth, and he arrived thanks to help from Russia. In a separate capsule, uh, America's Mark Vandehei and two other Russians landed safely in Kazakhstan. Vandehei spent a record 355 days in space. He was given a lift back to Earth by the Russians. Uh, one of the cosmonauts says on Earth uh, there may be problems between the countries, but in outer space, the U.S. and Russia are on the same team. Up next, analysis of a troubling trend of violence toward Christians in Nigeria. Plus, why the Holy Father says today's society does not protect the vulnerable. A Catholic priest is among others who were kidnapped in Nigeria over the weekend. Assailants abducted Father Leo Raphael Ozigi after he celebrated Mass on Sunday. However, this is not an isolated incident. 
as many other Christians in Nigeria have faced attacks from Fulani Muslims. And joining me now is Leela Gilbert, fellow at the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute and senior fellow for International Religious Freedom for the Family Research Council. Leela, welcome. So good to see you. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, can you talk to us more about those abductions that occurred over the weekend? Well, yes, it's part of a pattern of abductions that have been going on for a very long time, and it's gotten increasingly worse in the last few months. And this is uh, unique in that some of this is now in the middle belt, which wasn't so much a part of Nigeria that was under attack, but it is now. And these uh, these uh, kidnappers are part of the Fellini, uh, excuse me, the Fellini tribe, but they're radicalized Muslims, and so they're attacking Christians in order to uh, diminish them in the population. Yeah, and as we mentioned, of course, as you know, this was not an insul uh, isolated that is incident. Can you talk about maybe some of the other incidents that took place? I have reports of of 50 Christians having been murdered on that same day. It's hard to tell if it was the same incident or if it was a separate one, but just days before that, there was a kidnapping of 46 other Christians on March 20th, and on the, on the 21st, a service in Kaduna was attacked, and there were at least 25 murdered. So it's the, you know, getting the numbers right is very difficult because there's no one there to really keep track of all this. These are carnage incidents, and people are scattered, and there's no real documentation for maybe sometimes weeks, but this was in the last week. And so we know it happened. There's no question. It's coming from several sources. Yeah, it's so horrific uh, to think about what's happening over there. For those maybe who aren't that familiar about what's taking place in Nigeria and why, can you talk about, you know, why Christians specifically are being targeted? Christians are targeted because when radical Islamists get involved, they want to eliminate Christians and create a state that is officially Muslim. And so they go after Christians. They also know that, that by kidnapping them, they can get ransoms. But the murders are real slaughters. They're yelling Allahu Akbar when they kill. We have so much record of this, and it's been going on for years. This is not new, but it's gotten worse. You know, uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, designated uh, Nigeria as a country of particular concern. Less than a year later, the Biden administration dismissed that designation, and it's completely unexplained. And it would have helped because it would have provided sanction opportunities against leadership there. But now there's just not much anybody can do except keep reporting these horrible bloodbaths. Yeah, and Leela, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'm curious. Um has the Nigerian government done anything to put an end to this violence? And what do you think should be done by the international community? The international community needs to speak up because they've done virtually nothing. In fact, there's rumor that they are actually assisting at least in turning a blind eye. They don't show up when the police are called. It looks more like they're at least turning a blind eye and maybe even worse than that. Well, Leela, thank you so much for your time today and talking to us about this very important subject. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's pray for them. Absolutely. And finally tonight, Pope Francis warns against being inclusive, saying the concept is more focused on being politically correct and does not go far enough to protect the most vulnerable. Questi movimenti dello spirito che ci fa umano. At his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says our society is too focused on happiness and physical needs and not enough on spirituality. Because of this, many people miss the signs that God is putting in our life every day. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.